Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at New Dublin. We are glad that you're here and invite you to uh, sign the fellowship pad that's at the end of your pew so that we have a record of your attendance. I promise you we will not bug you. I will not cold call. Well, I might cold call you, but I won't call visit you. Uh, and it does really help for us to know roughly um, how many people we have on a given Sunday. And it helps you all know who you're sitting by if you're in the awkward position of not knowing. <laughs> there are a number of announcements in your bulletin that I... Well, they're actually not. I'm in the habit of saying that, and today there's not a number of announcements in your bulletin. There are very few today. Uh, first, we thank Gil and Pat Rosenberry for these beautiful flowers on the uh, in honor of his parents' 82nd wedding anniversary. Not in your bulletin is that fellowship and member care want to extend a thank you uh, to everyone who helped with food and setup and tear down uh, for Anne's funeral yesterday. And also, thank you to fellowship and member care. You all do a lot, and we appreciate it. Finally, you'll see in your bulletin that the session has voted to upgrade our ancient and technological terms sound system. I know some of you will be very pleased to hear it. And uh, if you would like to contribute to that, please talk to Gail or to Jim that way. Is there anything else that we need to hear this morning for the good of the people? <clears throat> then let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the Almighty God. Rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, our God, we give you thanks that you have done us the great honor of inviting us to join in the worship that is eternally going on around your throne with the angels and the archangels and all those who have gone before us. We pray that you would grant us this morning with a sense of your majesty that we just spoke about and with a sense of the honor that it is to join such people and beings in your worship, that we may do so reverently and with all sincerity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 477.
Brothers and sisters, the scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it also tells us of a God who is more eager to forgive than we are often to ask for forgiveness. And who will not hesitate when we come to him. So in faith and in penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. We confess to you, Lord, that we are not the people we like others to think we are. We have forgotten you and failed in our relationships with others. We have been fearful about ourselves and anxious about the future. We have spoken harsh words. We have been boastful of our achievements and envious of the success of others. We have pursued our own ends and given little thought for the needs of others. But we believe that you know us as we are and you love us. Lord of our life and our helper at all times, forgive us and enable us to forgive others. In the name of Christ our Savior. As we will hear in a few minutes, we do not have a Savior who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, because he was tempted in every respect as we are, but did not sin. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, and be at peace. scriptures read, let us pray. O Lord, we are pressed on every side by words from many, many different sources, many of them promising us all sorts of glorious things. But we know that your word alone will bring us life and joy and peace. And so we pray that here and now you would silence every voice that is not yours so that we may truly hear and truly believe what you say to us today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 2. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him while God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while, lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, 
now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. This is the word of the Lord. God. <clears throat> We're starting off this morning with a promise, and it's a surprising promise. The preacher of Hebrews, remember Hebrews is a sermon, the preacher of Hebrews doesn't have it in front of him, but he knows that somewhere in the scriptures it says, what is mankind that you are mindful of them and the son of man that you care for him, right? He knows somewhere. The problem is, you know, we've got these handy little books. It's easy enough for us to look something up, although harder without Google. I don't know how you all did it before Google. They just had scrolls, and they're expensive, and they're unwieldy, and uh, most people don't have access to them at most times. Uh, you know, a, a synagogue might not even have all of them. Uh, so the best he can do is someone said somewhere that he's right. Someone did say somewhere. It's in Psalm 8. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. Picking up the thread from last week about how angels are, you know, sort of sparklier than Jesus, but not actually more important, he picks up that thread again. It isn't to angels, he says, that God has given authority over the world to come. It's to human beings, to human beings who were made in God's image, bearing God's likeness, who at least originally shared in God's creative and life-giving and life-preserving authority over creation. Human beings, he says, have been exalted over creation. And then he has to tell you the truth, just like I do, because that's not what we see right now, is it? When we look around or see the news or have a chat with our neighbor, the world is not exactly overflowing with creative and life-giving and life-preserving acts on all sides. They're there, but we're just as likely, maybe more likely, to see the opposite. Not necessarily big, dramatic acts of destruction, although that happens more than we wish it would, but the petty little things as well. You know, the backstabbing comments and the brutal competition at work, the zero-sum game, someone will win, someone will lose, the little assumptions we make about each other, the ways that we're cruel or careless in our interactions with other creatures or with the earth itself. Such as it is, our authority often seems to be the opposite of creative and life-giving. And we have to say, such as it is, because a lot of times we're just at the mercy of the world without any authority or control. We see it in natural disasters. We see it in the painful, often, fact that two objects can't take up the same space at the same time. Car crashes, bullets. We see it in our 
agonizing inability to keep bad things from happening to us and to the people we love. If I had authority over the world, my dad would not have had a heart attack and died. If you had authority over the world, fill in the blank, I know you know. The preacher of Hebrews gets that, and he acknowledges it very frankly. Right now, he says, we don't see that everything is subjected to human beings. We don't see it. I don't see it. You don't see it. He didn't see it either. We're not living in utopia, and neither is he. Right now, it is nearly impossible, maybe it is impossible, to look around at the world and extrapolate the promise of God in Psalm 8, that in putting everything under humans, God left nothing not subject to them. So what do we do with it? What do we do with this promise that the preacher of Hebrews has pulled out of the psalm? What assurances can we possibly have that everything is going to turn out the way God meant it to from the beginning, that God's plan of benevolent, kind, many creators who rule the earth is going to work out? We can't see that all things are subject to us, says the preacher. But we can see Jesus. And do you remember what happened with Jesus? From the beginning, we're told he was equal with God the Father, and at a certain time, we say in the creed, for us and for our salvation, he was made lower than the angels for a time. He takes on human nature, becomes one of us, and dies, and breaks the power of death, and was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, took actually his human nature and human body into heaven with him, that's what ascension means, and is again seated at the right hand of the Father, reigns with him, crowned with glory and honor. You could call it a parabola if you wanted to be fancy. I am going to call it the swoop of salvation, and if you don't like it, we can chalk it up to new parent sleep deprivation, because I came up with it at 2 o'clock this morning. <laughs> the swoop of salvation, the glory that Jesus had with the Father from beginning, down through his coming to earth and death, up through his resurrection and ascension and reigning with God in glory. Pay attention, he says. We gotta pay attention so that we don't drift away. Last week we were talking about angels and over and over and over again, this preacher hammered home that despite all appearances, Angels are not nearly as interesting or powerful or important as Jesus is. And today is the payoff. He shows us why he was so, so, so focused on that last week. And it's not because he's just interested in making a detailed chart of the relative ranks of everything that lives in heaven. He's not interested in metaphysical trivia. Because he thinks that getting clear on who Jesus Christ is will have a real material impact on our ability to live hopeful, loving, faithful lives. Getting clear on what we can call today the swoop of salvation will help us live as God intended us to do in a world where it seems much more likely that it is evil that all things have been subjected to instead of Jesus. <coughs> And the reason that getting clear on who Jesus Christ is has such an effect on our life is that this swoop of salvation doesn't just apply to Jesus. It applies to us as well. It's hard to see it, isolated, maybe even impossible to see it when you're somewhere down here at the bottom of the swoop. But it's true. His swoop is our swoop too. I spent a while trying to figure out a good metaphor to convey what's going on here, but it's probably best that I not be fancy and just stick with the one that is in the Bible. We find in today's scripture passage the metaphor of an older brother. 
Maybe he's a lot older. Maybe this works best if you picture a significantly older brother, late teens maybe, holding his infant or toddler sibling. That's you. You're the baby. Jesus is the older brother. And one day, after spending the morning in the house, you toddle off out the back door and you go down the yard and you fall into the creek. The creek in question, according to the preacher of Hebrews, is death and the fear of death. It's the separation from God that begins in Eden and keeps us from true happiness and wholeness. And you can't get out of the creek. And it's cold, and it's wet, and it's uncomfortable, and there's probably snakes, and there's definitely leeches. And you don't see any way to get back out of the creek because the banks are too steep and the stones are too slippery and your hands are too numb from the cold water to be able to really hold on properly. And you're a baby, so you're probably wailing at the top of your lungs. You're at the very bottom of your swoop. And Jesus, the older brother, sees that you're in trouble and Jesus is going to do something about it. So he comes down from the house, from his eternal place, his equal with God, down to where we are screaming in the creek, wades right in there with us, gets just exactly as wet and muddy as we are, and scoops us up out of there, dries us off, cleans us up, takes us back home with him. He suffered death, Hebrew says, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone and then bring many sons and daughters to glory. So you see how it works. The swoop of salvation that Jesus experienced is the same one by his grace that we will experience. That's why he experienced it. It wasn't necessary for him to experience any swoops of salvation, but it's necessary for us because we've already done the bottom half. If we're going to get out of the creek, we need Jesus to come and pull us out. That's how we can know that it's true, the promise in Psalm 8. We don't see right now that human beings are reigning in any kind of good way over creation that reflects the rule of God, but we do see Jesus. We see that Jesus suffered as we suffered, and we see that now Jesus reigns in glory. And since he's not just some random man, but really, Hebrews says, the pioneer of our faith, really our older brother, we can trust that our lives and the life of the world will follow the pattern he set. That's what a pioneer does, right? Goes out into the wilderness, into the unknown, and makes a trail that other people can follow. We can trust that his path will be our path, and his swoop will be our swoop. That's our hope. That's the reason we can look at the absolute disaster that is often our world and our lives and live in joy anyway. That's why the preacher of Hebrews reminds us first thing this morning to pay attention. It's so that we can know and remember And be reminded that again and again, despite all appearances, we are not lost causes. And our world is not a lost cause. Because we have a big brother. And he knows the way home. And he's not going to put us down until we get there. So to the God of all grace, who by the work, power at work within us, is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The hymn is number 423. Gratitude for all God has given to us, let us return to the Lord, the tithes and offerings of our life and labors. on earth is yours, our God. 
And we do not bring you these things as if we are giving you something that you did not already have, but asking you that you would use them to accomplish more than we could. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. While I fish my pen out of my pocket somewhere, here it is. We are come to the time where we pray at length, usually for our, uh, our world and our church and each other and our concerns. We continue to pray for the Brockenborough family uh, as they grieve the loss of Anne. There's something, that I've forgotten something. What else do we need? Somebody remind me. What else are we praying for this week? We'll pray for Martha. Absolutely. Well, the Lord knows all of our concerns, so we will trust that he does and go to him in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks that you want to hear from us, that you are not so exalted that you do not care about the concerns of our life, that even though you know what we need, you want to hear from us anyway. And we give you thanks that when we do not know how we ought to pray, your spirit prays with us in sighs too deep for words. And you who search our inmost being know what the Spirit means. We pray to you for your church in all the ways and in all the places it shows up, all the ways that you have called it into being. We pray for the church in places where it is dangerous to be the church, where either through policy or through attitude, the church is subject to threats or to violence. This morning especially, I pray for the church in Ethiopia. And also, we pray for the church in places where it seems too easy to be the church, where The threat is not violence or persecution, but complacency. We pray that you would give your church all that it needs to faithfully witness to you in all circumstances. And we pray for the world that you made and that you love and that you sustain every day. We pray for places that are torn by violence by war or the rumor of war, or through civil unrest, that you would grant a just and honorable peace. We pray for places that are affected by natural disaster, that the world would not forget them, that rebuilding would happen thoroughly and completely. We pray for our own country, the United States of America. We pray for our president and our governor and for all who make and enforce our laws and for all who form our culture, that all you have placed in positions of authority, whether that is official authority or unofficial influence, would exercise that influence and that authority in ways that demonstrate care for their people and not selfish or partisan motives. We pray for those who are dearest to us this morning, especially the Brockenborough family and Martha, and others whom we name for you now in silence.
We ask your special care and comfort for those who are sick, for those who are distressed, for those who are grieving, for those who are dying, for those who are lonely. You are the physician of our souls, and you know better than we do what we need. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is number 155. fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you all now and forever. Amen.